Hello everybody! In this video we're going to tour parts of the Slater Museum's bird collection. So before we dive in and start looking at some of our bird collection, let's actually talk a little bit about the history of our bird collection. The bird collection started in 1930 when Professor Alcorn started teaching here at the Slater Museum. Uh, so his main interest was ornithology and he kind of added his bird collection to Professor Slater's already existing herpetology collection. So the birds take up kind of the most real estate here in the museum. We don't, they kind of have this most area. We'll, I'll kind of show you the spaces they take up. They take up a whole bunch of like our lockers and storage here. For the most part, the birds in our collection are going to look like this. So instead of a traditional taxidermy, like, like this, where the bird looks like it's in kind of a like a lifelike natural pose, most of our birds are going to be like this. This is a round. Um, these are easier to store, so we get a lot more of them in to our cabinets because the Slater Museum is mostly a research museum. So we want to be able to have as many specimens as possible. To go with that, a lot of our birds have been used in some really cool research that I'll talk a little bit about as we go through certain parts. Now, because our bird collection is so big, I'm not gonna be able to show you every single part, so I'm just gonna pick a few really cool highlighted specimens to talk about and to give you kind of an idea of what the specimens look like. So let's jump into it. All right, so first we're gonna start by taking a look at some of our teaching bird collection, just a few of them. So I just wanted to kind of show you how we organize our drawers. So basically what we do is all of those cabinets I showed you are just filled with rows and rows of birds like these. Uh, normally for our research collection, each drawer is gonna be one species, but our teaching collection is much smaller. But every single bird has its like own individual spot. They're all organized based on species and date collected and uh, their sex, so male, female, age, if they're juveniles or young. So we just have a bunch of different birds here. These ones are cool. These are European starlings. They were introduced to America in I think the early 1900s, maybe late 1800s, because people wanted to have all the birds that were in Shakespeare plays in the United States, so they brought them to New York Central Park and let them loose. And now we have millions of them in the United States. We'll take just a couple more, we'll look at a couple more drawers. What we have, we have a bunch of sparrows here, juncos. And so we just have a wide variety of stuff, like I said, in our teaching collection. And now we will move on to some of our other birds in our research collection. All right, so this is another one of our very popular tour stories we tell when people come to the museum. It's a good example of why we have so many specimens. So take a look at all these different birds. Okay, we have all sorts of different colors. We have reds and greens and yellows and grays, um, some speckles in there. But guess what? These are actually one species of bird. These are all red crossbills. So the reason why we have so many different specimens is so we can show off all the variation that animals will have. Because right, just like us humans, we have different skin color, eye color, hair color, heights and sizes, so do animals. And it, it's good for the scientific record to show all that different variation. And also there's changes over time that happen as well. You might be asking why they're called crossbills. Let's see, where's a good one? Oh, we'll get this one. So take a look at that, oh, that beak. Gonna focus. There you go. Sorry. So that beak, see how it kind of looks like an overbite almost? And it crosses over itself. That's why they're called crossbills. Their beaks make like a little scissor shape. They can actually have, some of them have their beaks crossing left, some have their beaks crossing right. It's, and it helps them eat their favorite food. Their favorite food is the seeds in conifer cones. So those beaks help them kind of cut open to get to the seeds. Next, I wanted to take a look at some of our raptors. And I don't mean the dinosaurs. Uh, if you don't know, raptor is the term we use for meat-eating birds. So let's take a look in this drawer. So these first two right here are a very cool example. These are our northern harriers. 
Northern Harriers are a great example of what we call sexual dimorphism, where the male and the female look very different. Male Northern Har Harriers are gonna be this nice gray color, while the females are this reddish brown color. Okay. Most raptors don't really have a big color variation, but a lot of raptors do have sexual dimorphism in size, where the males are a lot smaller than the females, and the females are bigger to help them carry their eggs and defend their nests. We have a couple of other birds in here. Uh, we have an osprey. Okay. Ospreys are fish-eating birds. They hang out by lakes and riverways. And next to our osprey, we have a bald eagle, who is also a fish-eating bird. So these two will actually compete with each other over resources. Um, sometimes they'll steal each other's nests. They'll fight over fish. Okay. And then next to him, not really a true raptor, but we have a turkey vulture. They do eat meat, but they are more scavengers and they'll look for dead prey, prey. And that's actually why they have their bald head. The bald head helps it so all that gross rotten meat doesn't get stuck in their feathers. Um, they also have some of the strongest stomach acid to help them digest all that gross stuff. And one defensive strategy they have is they'll actually throw up if something's chasing them down. That way they can get lighter and they can take off really fast. So vultures, a very cool but also very gross animal. Okay. Then there's another group of raptors that everyone loves that I want to talk about. And that's going to be our owls. Okay. So... Everyone knows about owls. Everyone loves owls. They're wonderful. So we have a bunch of different species in here. Uh, these two right here are barn owls. Then under them we have a much bigger variety. Let's see. And we have great horned owls, barred owls, spotted owls. So owls are super cool. They're mostly nocturnal. They have excellent hearing excellent eyesight to help them hunt at night. Okay. So those are our raptors. Oh, let's take a look at some of their feet. So raptors have these very sharp pointed talons to help them hunt their prey. That's kind of their main tool for killing. Okay, so this is our very small penguin collection. We only have four penguins here in the museum. And we have four different species actually. This is a rock hopper. This is a little blue penguin a Magellaninic penguin, and a Galapagos penguin. You might notice that they kind of have like a yellow tinge to them, unlike a lot of the other birds. That's because seabirds have a lot of oils in their feathers. So unlike most of our other birds, when they're like turned into a specimen, they're like nice and clean. These birds' natural oils just stay so strong on them. So that's why like even the paper is a little stained. And that's why also in the collection, they're kind of like the one thing that kind of keeps a smell, even though they've been dead and turned into a specimen for, like this guy. This guy has been a specimen since 1954 and still can have a strong smell. That's just how much body oil they have on those feathers. So for the most part, our bird collection is mostly focused on Pacific Northwest natives. So things we could find here in Washington and Oregon, but we do, we are lucky enough to have some tropical species. Here we have a bunch of our toucans, which are native to Central and South America. While over here we have our hornbills, which are native to Africa and Asia. Now, even though they look very similar, just by looking at those big beaks, they are not very closely related. And they make an excellent example of something we like to call convergent evolution, where two groups of animals that aren't closely related look similar due to environmental pressures. So some things they have in common that might make them look so similar is they both have a heavy fruit diet. They both live in more warm tropical areas, but they actually do have a lot of differences with their beaks. So if we take a look at our toucan beaks, um, toucan beaks are actually much less heavy than our hornbill beaks. They're kind of made of a more spongy material inside. And toucans will actually use their beaks to fence or like sword fight with each other. And they also use it as a source of thermoregulation because they are in hot jungles. A lot of heat can escape from their beak and help them cool down. 
On the other hand, our hornbills, you, their beaks are heavier. They have these big things at the top called casts, and these casts actually help amplify their calls so they can help call the mates, and they'll headbutt each other with these casts. So even though their bills have similar structure looks and they live in similar places and have similar diets, they also have different uses for those bills. All right, so I'm about to show you the one of the most unique and interesting specimens we have here at the Slater Museum. So in this drawer, under this special wrapping that most of our specimens don't have, something really cool. This is a passenger pigeon. So passenger pigeons used to fly in huge flocks. Some people think of flocks of millions uh, above, like in the United States. They went extinct in the early 1900s. Um, I believe the number is like around 1905 when the last specimen was seen. So it's kind of a similar story to the American bison where people didn't know we could hunt things to extinction yet and so people just would continuously hunt passenger pigeons saying there's so many of them in the sky that doesn't really matter. This particular specimen is from 1895 so besides our fossil specimens this might be one of the oldest specimens we have in the museum as well as I think it might be one of the few extinct animals we have and we actually are lucky enough to have a couple of them. Okay. So yeah I would definitely look up the passenger pigeons. There's some thoughts of maybe possibly cloning them and getting normal rock pigeons that we have today to maybe raise them, like raise young that the DNA's changed. Kind of the similar idea that you might have heard of about cloning woolly mammoth, but who knows how well that will work. So not only do we have a very large bird collection, we also have a very large wing collection. So you might be wondering why we would want to have just a bunch of wings separately. Uh, you might have noticed the way the birds are prepared, their wings are actually dried in place. So we can't look at their wings anymore on our other specimens. But a lot of times scientists will want to do research projects involving bird wing shape, feathers shape and size and measurements. So it's good to prepare wings separately so they're available to look at. And actually our whole entire wing collection, or not our entire wing collection, but a lot of our wing collection is digitized and online. So I'll put a link to those images below. Um, we have all sorts of different wings here. We have those long ones we were just looking at, the long seen ones are albatross. Those white ones at the top were swans. Uh, here we have a flamingo wing. So yeah, we just have a whole bunch of different wings that can be used for different purposes. Uh, this really rounded pretty one here is a turkey wing actually. So it's kind of short and round because turkeys don't do like very much long distance flying. They mostly just want to like fly and hop up into a tree and then they have this nice iridescent coloring. So you can learn a lot about a bird by looking at its wing shape and size and that will kind of tell you what kind of flight patterns it has. You can also learn a lot from their feathers and here's actually a cool experiment we do with feathers or a kind of little demonstration. So first take a look at this feather. Okay, this feather is a swan feather. You can tell it's like nice and straight. And when a swan flies, they aren't too worried about noise because they're up during the day. They're really easy to see. So take a listen to this. Okay. On the opposite end, an owl, they are up at night and they need, they like to have silent flight. That way they could sneak up on their prey. So it has fringed ends, which kind of helps keep them quiet while they're flying. So when I flap this feather, you're not actually gonna hear very much. Right? So by them having fringed ends, that helps them silently fly to help them hunt their prey. And these wings right here are all uh, snowy owl wings. Okay. Another interesting part to our bird collection is we have nests and eggs and actually one of the main research projects that the Slater Museum was a part of was including our egg collection. In the 1960s you might have known that a bunch of different bird species 
their numbers were declining very quickly. And at the time, a new type of pesticide called DDT was being used very heavily. And some, some scientists theorized that DDT was having an effect on birds and that was helping cause their decline in numbers. And what they thought might be happening is that the chemicals were affecting how much calcium were in eggs and so birds would crush their own eggs because the shells were getting weaker. And so some scientists actually came to the Slater Museum and what they did is they measured the thickness of eggshells uh, before the use of DDT and then after, I mean during the use. And what they saw is actually that eggs were millimeters thinner during the use of DDT. So our collection really helped show this major problem that was causing large scale uh, danger to several different bird species. Yeah, we just have a whole bunch of different eggs here. Uh, right here, this is our teaching collection, so not as much data as had on these. We also have a lot more nests and eggs, but I'm not gonna go through them all, but we just have them stored all over. Um, these are some of the re really pretty ones. They have this nice like kind of color sheen to them. And here are some really big eggs, some ostrich eggs. So that was a quick kind of highlight reel of our bird collection. I hope uh, the filming style was okay. I know it kind of, it's gonna cut from like random drawer to random drawer. I wasn't sure if that'd be better than me walking from like drawer to drawer and you watching me walk all over the museum. So I hope it's okay. And like I said, thank you for joining me and I hope you watch the next parts of our virtual tour. All right, bye.